It was early August in 1914, just as the United Kingdom was preparing to enter the First World War. The dimming of one day, the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, stood at his office window watching the light being lit in the square below and reflecting on all that was taking place across Europe. He turned to someone who was visiting him and said, the lights are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. What was particularly accurate and acute about that reflection was that the events of the First World War would of course change the landscape of Europe and really the world. Um, uh, there would be things that would be permanently altered and permanently changed, never to be seen again. I suspect that is not terribly dissimilar to the way some of us have felt in uh, many of the days of the last year that things were changing that would never go back to what we've known, that things were dramatically different. We were facing unknown futures. These have been wild and interesting years and it would be easy to see only darkness surrounding us. But again and again and again, the people of God come to these early days of Advent when the light is rarer and the darkness seems to envelop us before the workday is even over. When the cold really gets into our bones, in these days, the people of Christ return again and again and again to acknowledge the darkness that exists in our world, and which seems particularly acute this year and in the last couple of years. And into such darkness, the people of Christ assert every year that there is light. And that our task and our responsibility and our privilege and our joy is to look for the light. I'm inviting you to embrace that with enthusiasm and joy and hope this year. To look for the light. The darkness is easy to spot. And let me tell you what, there are plenty of people who don't need any help finding signs of darkness. But the people of Christ are called to look for the light and to speak into the darkness that different days are coming. We've heard from the prophet Jeremiah uh, today who spoke into a profoundly dark and confusing time and said the days are surely coming over and over and over again. 11 times the prophet Jeremiah says the days are surely coming. The days are coming when things will be different. The days are coming when things will be different. The days are coming, coming on their way when things will be different. And so it is our responsibility to look at this moment in which we live and to be honest and sincere about all of the problems and challenges, all of the darkness that seems to envelop us, but to say into such a moment, the days, the days are surely coming when things will be different. Jesus assures his disciples in the text we've heard from Luke this morning, that there will be signs that things are changing. This uh, promise is asserted in all three of the synoptic gospels. And we read this assertion from one of the synoptic gospels every year on the first Sunday of Advent. So this year it's Luke, when you're it's Mark, uh, when you're it's Matthew, but every year we come to this brand new new year in the Christian cycle. So happy new year. If you didn't know today was 
New Year's Day. Today is New Year's Day for Christians. We come to this new moment. We come facing the coming year, facing what's next, and say, there will be signs. There will be signs that the world is changing. There will be signs, my brothers and sisters, that the, the world is changing, but that the part of this promise that's so essential to pay attention to that Jesus makes to his disciples about the, the changes that are at hand is that the existing order will fight back. That the existing order that prophets from the way things are and the way things have been will not come quietly into the new future that God is creating. That among the signs will be the pushback of those who, who, who think the world was better before. Now, those signs of darkness are easy to see, are they not? That the ways the existing order is pushing back even in this very moment, the way the existing order of patriarchy is pushing back and resisting, the way the existing order of white supremacy is holding fast to all that they can muster and maintain of that which remains. I was heartbroken, but not terribly surprised by the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. Because let's face it, there are people who live in our midst who are just kind of okay with white men shooting others in the streets if it suppresses change and progress. And some of those people sit in judges' benches and help the existing order maintain control. And there are some people who benefit so much and appreciate so much the systems of patriarchy that are endemic in our society that they are going to do whatever they can, pass any law they can, if they're able to resist the notion that women should have bodily autonomy. The existing order likes the power and privilege that they have. And they will not give it up lightly. Jesus assures us of this. So the thing is, when we see those signs in our midst, yes, it is a sign of darkness, but it's also a sign of light. Because that effort to resist and repel change and justice and, and righteousness and the reign of God's kingdom, those efforts exist because the world is changing. And we have been gifted with the faith to see both the darkness and the light. Another text that we are profoundly mindful of in the seasons of Advent and Christmas is one you likely know from Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. I wanna invite you to embrace that as your theme. In these challenging days, 
of conflict and frustration, of fear and anger, and all that exists around us. Name the darkness. Name the resistance of the existing order, but name too the presence of the light which you have been graced to see and trust. You know it exists. You, you, you may walk in darkness, but you have seen a great light. And as long as there's even just a little bit of light, here's the remarkable thing. It's easy to make light grow. Think about the lamps that Sir Edward Gray thought were going out all over Europe. You can dim a lot of lamps, but you only need one to stay lit. And that gives you the power, the ability to relight all the others. Think about the, the potential that exists within one single candle. If there was no other light in this sanctuary this morning, save the, the one light that Sue and Tony lit for us today, that one candle would be all we would need to share light with one another. It's enough to see by and more than enough to share until all have some glimpse of light. Sir Edward Gray was right in the sense that things would be entirely different on the other side of World War I and they would be not great for a long, long time. but it is within our capacity to light lamps if we're willing to do so, if we have the courage and the hope and the confidence to do so. It almost always means though that, that things are different on the other side of massive events, like the ones we are living through right now in this very moment. Really the courage to light lamps in a new age requires the courage to give up what's gone and to embrace what God is doing now. And that's what Advent is essentially about. Walking into what's next, participating in what's new waiting and watching for what's unfolding and sharing whatever light is yours to see by. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.